low network connection right off the bat. Thank you. I, oh, there we are. Connection available. What up, fam? It's your boy, ZDog MD. It's been a while since we've done a live show with guests on location, but I'm here today with Dr. Adam Ackerman. Adam is a hospitalist at Yale, so Mr. Smarty Pants, uh, but also the author of a, what I think is a really important study in JAMA that came out as a pilot study about using subcutaneous opiates instead of IV in an effort to make a dent in, in the levels of addiction and dependence that we're seeing as outpatients. And a lot of this starts as inpatients. But before we dig into Adam, who is the man, we're going to dig into a guy who may also be the man, Andy Loind. Say hi, everyone. Hey, everyone. How's it going? So Andy, as you guys know, if you're a supporter, you saw the show I did last night from the hotel with Andy. Uh, Andy's our executive producer. He's going to be wandering. We're here at the Institute for Healthcare Improvement. I like just being at the Institute. It's very... It makes you feel good, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah. Back at the Institute, we <laughs> discovered many things uh, about quality improvement and things like that. And that's what this conference is about. I'm doing a keynote this afternoon. Andy's hustling around to find like-minded companies that are actually making a difference. So if you're one of those, come find Andy at the show and tell him, I want to be on Z Dog Show because we want to spread the word. Adam's crew reached out to me and was like, hey, you know, we're doing some cool stuff on opiates if you ever want to spread the word. And I'm like, uh, do I? As long as it comes with free opiates for me, I'm on board. So let's see. How are we doing? Hi, Rhonda. What's up, Heidi the Ginger? These are supporters uh, chiming in already. We got 213 people watching. I say we dig in. Adam, why are you interested in this problem of opioids in the first place? As a hospitalist, isn't our job just to give people a ton of IV narcotic, make them feel good until there's someone else's problem? So good question. First of all, thanks for having me on the show. My pleasure. This is, this is great. Um, I think... What we've noticed over time is that we know that IV opioids work to help control pain. Everyone knows that. I think the problem that we have, though, is that they come along with uh, more adverse effects than either subcutaneous dosing or oral dosing. I'm talking about nausea, itching, but also major stuff, hypotension, mm. low blood pressure, difficulty with low oxygen saturations in the hospital. And then there's the whole idea of this kind of dysphoria or euphoria for some patients, which also is increased by IV uh, administration. And the reason we think that's the case is because you get such rapid spiking levels of drug in the brain and in the in the bloodstream in general when you use IV that you get a lot of these extra effects which are not helpful for pain but cause trouble. Okay, so let me unpack some of that stuff because it's all very important. The idea that there are side effects to narcotics and some of those are worse with intravenous administration including hypotension, itching, dysphoria and euphoria and then the question of with the pharmacokinetics of the drug have there been uh, any studies in animals or humans looking at, is there an increased addiction or dependency potential with IV versus subcutaneous or oral? So what we know is that in animal models, when you rapidly spike the level of drug in the brain, and then you do that over and over and over again, that is the thing that drives the addiction process forward. So when you put somebody in the hospital on IV morphine every four hours, that's kind of what we're doing. You know, so is it a dopamine thing? You're giving IV and you're, the levels are going up high instantly and this huge flood of dopamine and maybe that's a trigger for the uh, addiction process, the dependency process? So that's part of the, that's part of the idea. And I'm, I'm not a basic scientist, so I don't want to necessarily get into the brain chemistry parts of that as much because I want to make stuff up. Hey, oh, but, wait, that's <laughs> never stopped me, my brother. <laughs> <laughs> but what we know is that we, that does drive the addiction process forward. Um, in humans, they've done fMRI study mm -hmm. on the brain. They take people that have never had a narcotic before. Yeah. We give them a one dose of morphine. I want to volunteer in that and, and then they put them in the MRI machine. The brain already starts to look like an addicted brain. With one dose with, of with IV. one dose of IV morphine. So in functional MRI, it's already lighting up like uh, whatever the Christmas tree looks like in someone who suffers with addiction. Exactly. Okay, so one of the things I want, to, I want to clarify right off the bat, because this happens in every show we do about pain control, narcotics, addiction people with chronic pain come into the comments and they'll say you are trying to take away my opioids these are the only things that help me uh, this pendulum has swung too far there's no real opioid crisis it's all manufactured mm -hmm. now 
My take on this, and you can tell me how you weigh in, is that no, uh, yes, there is a problem with opioids. People are dying all over the place. It's partially created by us because we've been giving these drugs without really understanding the ramifications. Pharma actually was teaching us to use these drugs and saying there's no addiction potential when there's pain. Well, that was wrong. So the question is not don't treat pain. The question is not abandon people with chronic pain. The question is not let people suffer in the hospital because that's the other thing people are gonna say. Hey, Adam, like you wanna torture these patients? Like as a hospitalist, the only thing in my tool belt is to help relieve suffering. Mm. And you wanna say, well, IV is so effective, why would we mess with it? This is all the, the objections we're gonna get. Now, so tell me, when you designed your sort of study, you know, did you think about this stuff and what did you actually do and find? So I gotta be perfectly honest with you. You know, I, I was really not trained to use subcutaneous opioids. Neither was I. And I think Just a lot in of hospice, people, sometimes we do it. Yeah, yeah, yeah. exactly. A yeah. lot of people are gonna say, oh, wait a second, is this like a new thing? It's mm. really not new at all. If you talk to older physicians and nurses who've been around doing this a lot longer than we had, that used to be one of the only ways you would give opioids in the hospital. So older, how much older? Like, when were they doing this? Uh, you know, 25 years ago. Um, there's a lot of literature, especially in post-operative patients, and you know, major surgery, cardiac mm -hmm. surgeries, uh, C-sections, all kinds of things, uh, all kinds of different surgeries where they used subcutaneous opioids and proved them to be efficacious. Mm. Um, what, what I think is the most important thing to remember is that we're not trying at all to take away opioids. Mm. We're trying to give them in as safe a method as we can. Not only that, but maybe and as effective a method as we can as well too. So that's the trick, and that's what got me really interested because when I read the results of your trial, you know, what, what he found, and we'll talk about the trial itself, I think, but what, what he found was when you give these drugs subcutaneously, you get initially very similar levels of pain control, and at day three and four, significantly better? Actually, pain scores improved, which was a surprise. We were checking that to make sure that we weren't making ourselves feel better by right. making our patients feel, feel worse. worse. Yeah. They weren't just the same, they were actually improved. So, and this tells you something, because what they did was they took a, a, a bunch of patients at Yale and they said, okay, the first group is gonna get standard care. So mostly IV narcotics. And why is it standard care? It's in the order sets, right? Oh, it's built in, it's yeah. baked in. The default in our EMR, when you pull up morphine or Dilaudid, it's, it's IV. IV. Now, there, now there's a button right next to it. That says sub-Q. Subcutaneous. Right. And there's even one that says intramuscular, which is really throwing it way back. Old school. But it's right there. It's in the policies already, the pharmacy. You didn't have to change any of that stuff. Right. But it does default to IV. Yeah, yeah. It's baked in. And so that tells you that you're, we talk about elephant rider and path, our unconscious emotional engine that makes a lot of decisions for us based, based on schema that are unconscious then you have the rider that can override that, this conscious little guy on the top, and then you have the path that they're walking on, which is our systems. Mm -hmm. Our systems are designed to back up what our elephant thinks, which is IV is better, mm -hmm. stronger, more powerful, better pain control. Mm -hmm. And then the rider goes along with it and goes, well, I wanna make sure that I don't hurt my patients, so mm -hmm. let's give them IV. So it's a setup to use IV. What Adam found in his pilot trial, which is, admittedly was a small trial, it was a before-after type of deal, published in JAMA though, what they found was, <laughs> equivalent to better pain control using subcutaneous with an 84% reduction in IV narcotic use in the hospital, in the, in the case group. That's is right. Is that correct? That's yeah. correct. Um, you know, and the nice thing about this is that uh, we, f we found again that we were able to use fewer IV doses, mm -hmm. but we were also not just switching people over from IV to sub-Q, overall IV plus sub-Q went down by about 55%. And total opioid exposure, even with oral opioids, went down as well too. So overall, we have better pain control and overall less IV, less uh, opioid um, exposure in our patients. So see, this to me is not even counterintuitive because subcutaneous probably has a slower uptake. It's maybe long lasting. There's a kind of a depot effect. You don't get the euphoria as much. Mm -hmm. And so patients are maybe asking for it less, and, but yet the pain is controlled. So to me, this is a centerpiece of how we can think about, are we setting up patients for addiction? 
and dependency, starting with our care in the hospital. They come in with a broken ankle or a hip or a something that got acute appendicitis and we put them on IV narcotic. They get the dopamine boost, their brain rewires. The next thing you know, they're on the orals outpatient, then they're escalating mm -hmm. and we see it time and time again. Mm -hmm. And so is this a way, and how, how, why did you even think about doing this? So uh, it, it's interesting, the, what happened was I was trying to think about how could we make the IV, the giving the IV process to be less of a less of a euphoria inducing process and less of a process that gives gives you so many of these adverse effects. Yeah. So I said, well, what if we just slow it down? You know, what if we give nurses watches or something? And I was going through all these ideas, and then I, I talked to one of my pharmacy colleagues, mm. and I said, well, what's what's a way we can give parenteral narcotics in a in a controlled way? He said, well, what about what about sub Q? It's called sub Q. I said, so we, well, we basically had just forgotten about this as a profession. I mean, it's there. It's been there. We just need to remember it. Let me ask you a question. So you brought, oh, wait, Andy's got a comment. Amber Watkins Grant says, wow, subcutaneous admin, that's the standard for insulin. So it's better for opioid admin in controlled settings. Cool stuff. Yeah. And you know, what's interesting is in Australia, I saw one of the comment on the JAMA articles, an Australian uh, nurse or doctor said, oh, this has been standard in Australia forever. And it's great. And so what's interesting is you did a couple things here. You actually reached out to a colleague in a different discipline, pharmacy, and said, what do you think? And the pharmacist had an insight. And this is why team-based interdisciplinary care, especially in the hospital, is so important. Because now you've cross-pollinated ideas with someone on the front line who's actually giving the drug. Here's a question. How did the nurses feel about the protocol that you guys were instituting? Was there a resistance? I gotta tell you, the nurses were the champions of this project, and I have to just, you know, give a shout out to all my nurses, and you all know who you are. Um, so the nurses took this, and they started to use it, and they were a little interested to see what was gonna happen. But they started to notice that their patients were actually having their pain well controlled, and then they said, you know what, this is pretty good. And then all of a sudden, by the time I got into the room to talk to patients about things, they were already hearing about it from our nurses. And our nurses really took this and ran with it. That is amazing. And I, you know what's also amazing? Sue Lennon Bond is leaving a comment right here. And look, here she is. <laughs> How are you doing? Good. Welcome to the conference. Thanks. We just hijacked like an entire hall. And uh, I saw your comment. I just wanted to say yeah. hi. I've been coming to this conference for over 20 years. Why is it important to you? Because I'm passionate about improving quality and safety in healthcare. What's your background? I'm not even a clinician. Oh, so I'm one of those rare people that has no clinical training. Awesome. But, but, but you're passionate about keeping patients safe and improving yep. quality. See, we need this tribe in Dumbledore's yep. army. I've ex unfortunately experienced um, some loved ones that have had harm. Yeah. yeah. And we can do better, and we know we can do better, and this is going to be 5,000 people who all want to do better. I love it. <laughs> Thank you for inspiring us, yeah, Sue. Yeah, thanks. I'm glad I saw you as I was trolling Facebook in my session. Thanks for being part of the ZPAC. <laughs> So Isn't that comment. awesome? Yeah. Sean Renee is a Yale nurse here, and the SQ program is really working. Pain is controlled, and patients request the meds less often. It's, so there you go. So, so, so what we're seeing then, if I'm understanding right, is less opioid use overall, great patient satisfaction with pain relative to the placebo, which is IV. It's an active placebo. And we're seeing less overall use. Now, the question that I have is, are we going to see changes in actual levels of substance abuse addiction as outpatients? I think that that's the next question. Mm -hmm. I think that we're looking forward. You know, the surgeons are really looking at this in a very determined way because you know there were articles out last year that were talking about persistent opioid use after the exposure to having a surgery minor surgery major surgery and there's about six percent of people who have never had opioids before and they're still filling opioid prescriptions at three to six months there's your new chronic opioid users yeah. there um, what I will say as well too, talking about uh, our nurses and really taking this, this out into the rest of the hospital. So we did a, a pilot on one unit initially. My hospitalist colleagues that were rotating on that unit started to actually use this protocol in other units without even formalizing anything. And organically. Our, uh, organically, and our nurses were, were talking to their colleagues on other units as well. Um, so this led to you know, taking this to the entire hospitalist group. It's about 450 beds. 
and then we're now uh, the standard of care for the Yale New Haven Health System. So, you know, uh, I cannot overemphasize how important organic, grassroots, ground up change can be. Look how quickly it's adopted. Now, if the CEO of the hospital came down and he was like, everyone shall use subcutaneous opioids, that would be it. No, everyone would be like, you shut up. You don't touch patients. You touch patients. Not only do you touch patients, you're there in the trenches doing it with the nurses, with the pharmacists, with everybody there. So when it works, people actually spread it virally. Now this show is an implement and a tool to take what you might be able to present at a conference over a decade, several conferences, we can do it in a show mm. because already we have 800 people watching live and, and this is the new mechanism to disseminate cool stuff. Now, here's the thing. It's very unlikely that what he's doing is gonna cause harm. In other words, I wouldn't put you on the show and go, guys, this is something you guys can try if I thought it was gonna cause harm. Mm. Going to less opioids, sub-Q with good pain control, that's not gonna hurt anyone. Mm. We're not saying, oh, start opioids from, from someone who's not getting them. We're not, so, so this is actually something you can try. What's the dose equivalency of IV and sub-Q? So our pharmacists want us to think about morphine and Dilaudid as one-to-one -one IV sub-Q, so it doesn't take any conversion. Yeah, so we're just straight one-to-one. -one. So if you're gonna give two megs of morphine, IV, Q, two hours, PRN pain, you just make it sub-Q. Yep. And to see, this is, and we used to do this, I remember, it's certainly in hospice in the 90s, uh, Laguna Honda and other places where I worked in San Francisco, it was all sub-Q. And then suddenly we were pushing IV, and through my practice at Stanford, it was always, you know, IV, Q, two hours, and, and everybody was conditioned that that was the right answer. Again, elephant unconscious schema that we run. Well, yeah, yeah, and then it's backed up by the path that we're walking on, which is these order sets. Mm -hmm. And you, you had mentioned something about order sets. Um, there's a work Alex Chu is doing on order sets that have encouraged dispensing more, by default, more opioids. What's the deal with that? Yeah, so the surgeon, my surgery colleagues were looking at this problem on discharge prescriptions, right? So they looked in the EMR and they said, what's the default you know, Percocet prescription pulling up? And it was 30 pills and then you had to opt in to anything less than that. So if you thought your patient needed 12, you, you had to go out to of click, your way. You had to go out of your way. And so what they did was they just took those defaults and they just lowered them. Yeah. So that the, the it was it was harder to do the wrong thing. Yeah. Yeah. So that and that's I think that's the heart of quality improvement is making systemic changes that nudge our elephant and rider to walking on a path that makes it harder to do the wrong thing. We recently did a show about an error, a medical error, a tragic one at Vanderbilt. The patient was given vecuronium instead of Versed. That was a system that allowed auto population of a Pixis dispenser with VE, goes right to vecuronium, and yeah, there were a lot of human error components, but that system could be designed in a way that would make that error much less likely. Right. So, and that's what we're constantly trying to iterate at conferences like this. You know, I used to be very skeptical of the measurement industrial complex, as I like to call people who want to do these kind of things. And the truth is not just about measurement, it's about system design that helps reduce errors. And if you talk to people at this conference, all of them have a story of a loved one or a patient or someone who has died or been injured in a medical error that was preventable. And now it's their passion to prevent these errors. Your passion is maybe to say, I want to prevent people going down a path that leads to destruction, and I don't want to be, have, suffer the moral injury of being the person that started that. And so in an emotional sense, the scientific work you're doing resonates deeply with me, which is why I was so glad to have you on the show. Well, I'm really glad you had us on the show. I mean, this is, like you said, this is the way to get this word out. So everybody, I want you to do this. I want you to share this video I want you to think about starting a protocol or an order set in your hospital that tries out sub-Q. You can always go back to IV if you think it's not working. Mm -hmm. Now, ah, here's a question, and I'm sure we're gonna see comments to this effect. Patients with chronic pain will say, this will never touch me, I have to have IV, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Do you think that's dependency speaking? Do you think that's a behavioral thing that's happened from years of? Well, that's a, that's a great question. Yeah. That's a great question. And what, you know what I will say, is that if you can go to the bedside and you can offer a patient something that you, you don't just think is maybe you know morally better or whatever you want to say, but it's it actually more efficacious. Right. It's going to control their pain better and give them less side effects. And 
by the way, if it's this is what we do at our hospital because we know it works better, mm -hmm. that takes some of that power struggle at the bedside away. Yeah, right. So you can continue to have a therapeutic relationship with your patient because you really are trying to do the right thing for them. This is the thing. Nobody wants to punish patients. No one wants to keep them in pain. No one wants to deprive, put them into withdrawal. We, that's not what we want to do. In fact, it's counter to everything that we train, which is alleviate suffering, do no harm. This is a way to do that and keep an alliance with the patient because we're all aligned. So I, I, that's why I think it's fantastic. Now, um, a Ms. LeBaron asked me, can you share links to all of this so we can read about it? Yes. So since I'm on the floor here, I haven't been able to put links in, but after the fact, I'm gonna go back in, in the description, there'll be links to all of Adam's work. We're also gonna do a web post on ZDogMD.com where all that stuff lives. I want you to share this. I want you, if you believe in what we do, by the way, become a supporter of the show because then you get more private conversations that are uncensored. And this guy talks about his deepest, darkest secrets. That's right. Which is why he grew a soul patch out of the blue. <laughs> No one Seriously. told him to do it, and he just went and look. Just look. I was, I was in a rush. <laughs> Somebody once told me the world is sure to roll me. I ain't the shark. No, I don't know what that is. It's Smash Mouth, and that's who you are now. That's who you are, and I'm kidding. So anyways, guys, if you're at IHI, come see us. Um, Tell us what you're doing to tra change medicine to make it better like what Adam's doing and what everyone's trying to do on the front lines. It shows that an individual can actually help to transform the system, which means you can think about what you can do. And actually, it was your, your friend who's a, a colleague who's a PA who reached out to me. That's right. Kelsey. Kelly? Kelsey. Hey. So Kelsey, thanks for hooking us up. And, and she was like, hey, I think he's doing great work. He should be on your show. That's what I want you guys to do is think about how we can use this platform for good in the world, not just for Smash Mouth. We love you guys. We out.